Hello and welcome to 101 on Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. We're 101 with the serial entrepreneur Edose Ohe. He's the founder of Alpha Dando, Wireless NG, Glitch Donuts Cafe, among other businesses. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're most welcome. Okay, so you left IT to open a donut shop. How did that start? So, yes, I did leave IT. Mm -hmm. um, but but since you're back to IT now, but I want us to start from the beginning. Very so, beginning. Why did you do that? What was the move about? So what happened was um, for about four and a half years mm -hmm. after I graduated, I worked in the oil and gas sector. In about 2012, I was challenged to come to Nigeria for the first time. So it was about November for Thanksgiving. And when I came to Nigeria, I realized for the first time that this is where I actually wanted to be. Mm. Because growing up where I grew up, you don't really see a lot of um, black people in positions of power. Uh, you grow up, you know, you grow up in a very uh, multicultural setting. Uh, so when I came here, I felt at home. So when I went back, um, and about two weeks later, I quit my job. Okay, before you carry on that story, <laughs> is it just about um, the multicultural thing, or did you see a business opportunity? So. I saw a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, when I got here, uh, the first thing I remember doing is like when I came out the airplane, um, I walked into the airport and it was extremely hot. Okay. And I was like, oh my God. And when I got my luggage, we drove from the airport to a job site. And it took like six and a half hours. It was like 2012. It was a long, 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 long time. And the entire time I was trying to get on Twitter to tweet about my experience. Mm -hmm. And the problem was I could never get a signal. Wow. So I was asking myself, oh my God, like what's going on with the internet? And I didn't really understand the deficiencies at the time, but I realized that maybe I can try to address that space and move into IT. And you know, when I went to, we went to uh, Ekboma, we went to the farm, and I saw that we had some um, palm kernels and we had fruits, and I'm like, why not jump into farming as well? Mm -hmm. So I went back and I weighed my options. I figured being here will be a better opportunity for me. Okay, so when you resigned, what happened? When I resigned, I was actually in the middle of my MBA program. And um, I was, it was kind of like the week before, I was in my marketing class. And we were learning about uh, segmentation strategy and things of that nature. And I went home and I always used to watch the show on CNBC. It was called uh, How I Made My Millions. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the show and there was this show about these guys in a place called Seattle that were creating like these uh, gourmet donuts. And I was like, what is a gourmet donut? And when I left uh, uh, watching the show, I decided I went on Google and I was searching for top pot donuts and gourmet donuts in Houston or in the stateside. And I realized there was like this distinct trend for like gourmet donuts. So I told myself, why not be the first person in the South to actually do it? Mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, that kind of all happened at the same time. So it was like a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start a donut shop. I wanted to go back to Nigeria and I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Well, you started a donut shop. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to have a running business outside the shores of Nigeria? Now, it's um, where in the U.S. again? It's in Houston, Texas. It's in Houston, Texas. So um, you are running this business and you started it first there. Yes, the first business. I mean, we, ha we know what our perception is like over there when you hear I'm a Nigerian. How has it been running that business in that environment? Well, no, I think that it's, um, you know, Nigerians are um, very highly regarded. I think if we look at the, um, and I don't want to be, I don't know if this is a true fact, but I think it is, one of the most educated ethnic groups in the States are Nigerians. So generally speaking, it's not a, really a negative connotation, it's just that most Nigerians don't go into making pastries. Mm -hmm. What you have are doctors, lawyers, and engineers. Um, but starting the business was pretty interesting because first and foremost, um, my products are a little expensive. You know, it's not 29 cents or 39 cents, it's a dollar or two. Right, so what we were doing is we, were, we faced the first challenge of trying to um, recreate the market um, and tell people that a pastry product can be a premium good, mm -hmm. similar to like the cupcake. Like the cupcake then um, was selling for like $4, but people had already accepted the fact that this cupcake is a premium product. Mm -hmm. right, so it was a challenge not being a Nigerian per se, it was a challenge trying to convince the market that a pastry can be a premium product as well. Okay, so... Um I'm looking at it from the many news of fraud that have 
tweeted us on um, media lately mm -hmm. from the younger ones to the older ones and they keep telling you this news is affecting the way Nigerians are accepted outside of the shores of Nigeria, actually outside of the shores of Africa. Mm -hmm. So you being someone who goes out a lot and come back, how would you say, would you say it really affects your brand or your personality or have you been profiled? I, I think there's always going to be negative connotations associated with people in general, mm -hmm. especially groups of people. It just so happens that uh, it tends to be a lot of uh, fraud associated with Nigerians. Um, there's no way around it, but instead of focusing on the fact that there is a connotation of fraud, what we try to do is focus on the fact that there are a lot of us, more than a few of us, that are actually doing things the right way. Mm -hmm. So what we try to project is a positive image uh, specifically through social media, of what we are actually doing. Mm -hmm. So people can actually see that not everybody does fraud, and mm -hmm. it's only a few people that are actually doing fraud because there's many Nigerians doing great things all across the world. Uh, you have doctors, you have nurses, you have lawyers, you have engineers, you have scientists, you have so much going on. You have reporters, you have uh, philanthropists, you have entrepreneurs, you have so many different people doing good things so we can kind of take the focus away from the people who are doing the bad things and focus more on people who are actually doing good things. Mm -hmm. So that's what we try to do. Okay. So um, how do you run all these businesses from Alpha Dando to Alpha O and O to Wireless NG, Glitch Donuts? How do you manage them all? God. <laughs> okay. So that's a typical Nigerian answer. Well, how do you manage them? No, honestly, um, I think that what I've been able to understand um, over the last five years, I think 2013 to 2017, 18 were the most difficult years for me because I've never really um, immersed myself in starting my own business. And I never had any experience with completely managing, creating, and owning my own business. So it was very taxing emotionally, mentally, physically, um, spiritually, um, because during that time, like, I gained like 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. I was up 24 seven. I was trying to understand multiple markets. I was trying to deal with business in the States. I was trying to build business in Nigeria. And I was trying to do everything myself. And it didn't work. So mm -hmm. what I had to do was actually build a very strong team. And to answer your question, without going on a tangent, is the fact that I have a very strong team. And the people that I work with, because we are all teammates, um, they're very good at what they do. They believe in my vision and they have passion. So it allows me to be able to focus on different areas mm -hmm. and focus on growth in different sectors and you know, explore investing in different areas because when they are part of the team, they actually take it and they own it and they help me grow it. All right, let's go on a very quick break. But when we come back, we'll carry on this conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So before we went on that quick break, you were saying something about you having to work hard to understand the Nigerian market and then understand the market over there. What would you say is the significant difference? Fundamentally, two completely different markets. Okay. Um, the, it's, um, I would say that, you know, when you're looking at, um, let's say Houston, for example, what I am selling is going to be uh, perceived a lot differently there than here, for example. At the time, I couldn't think about bringing a glazed donut and selling a donut here for, what would that be, the equivalent of 5,000 naira. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to buy one donut for 5,000 naira. Okay. Right? But I had to convince people in Houston that it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Right, and I was also open. Uh, Glaze in Houston is open twenty four seven, and at the time it was a difficult thing to be open twenty four seven here because we have mixers, we have blenders, we have ovens, we have fryers, we have a whole kitchen, and it's always operating. And the cost of doing that here would have been significantly more because we would not be able to solely depend on the power system. So, from a fundament, from a infrastructure perspective, you have to have two different strategies to be mm -hmm. able to um, succeed. Let's talk about wireless NG. What is that about? Because I saw you put up something about it now being, I think, exclusively for West Africa, right? Oh, no. So what, what's yeah. happening is too, wireless NG is um, what, at first it started off as the internet service provider in Benin City, mm -hmm. right? We started that in like 2015, um, and it was a little, it was pretty small. We had about 10 customers at the time, just mm -hmm. local customers. And over the few past few years, we kind of treated it like a small family oriented organization, but we've experienced some significant growth over the last two to three years. 
We're at about 750 customers and we're shooting for about a thousand before the end of February next year. And um, as such, we've tried to restructure it to be a more corporate organized um, um, business. And we're kind of splitting into two different divisions. So we have Wireless NG, the enterprise side, and Wireless NG, the ISP side. Mm -hmm. And Wireless NG, the enterprise side now has exclusive rights for certain products from ViewSonic to sell in the region. Like smart TVs, interactive touch panels, um, you know, to facilitate collaboration, whiteboarding, annotation, and like, you know, um, smart desk. So you can have teams working together to be able to utilize um, technology to be able to improve processes. Mm -hmm. So the exclusive is just for certain products in the region. Okay, so um, your father was instrumental in you forming, or well, you being interested in information technology. Yeah. Now, you are a dad too, right? Yeah. And um, I think parenting is one subject people tend to not talk about, you just find yourself in there, right? So considering the relationship you had with your father and how you were brought up, and now that you have your own children, what would you say your role should be in their lives to determine what their career path will be? You know, my, my dad is, was, continues to be a great man. Mm -hmm. And I think that he was one of the most um, instrumental figures in my life. And I attribute pretty much all of my success to him and my mom's prayers. Mm -hmm. So both of the combination of the two. But my, um, my dad realized at a young age what he was able to look at all of us as kids and have an idea as to where we could possibly succeed even before we knew it. Um, both my sisters are anesthesiologists, they're really good doctors, and my youngest sister is a specialist in um, special education, and now she's a beauty guru. Um, and my father was able to see that then. And he kind of stirred us all, without pushing us and saying we have to do something, he kind of provided the tools and the paths for us to be able to go in the directions that he saw us succeeding in mm -hmm. and let us choose to accept it. And I want to implement that same model because to me, I think that Becoming a dad, I have a daughter, and she's everything to me. I can see the type of love that my father had for me. And in that love, I think it's important to understand that I want the best for her. Mm -hmm. So I want to do the same thing my father did for her, to be able to at least provide her with the tools she needs to succeed in whatever path she can go. And if I identify something that she'll be really good in, and you know, she at, at three years old, four years old, nine years old, 10 year old, you won't really understand what you want to do but I can put her in the path like my father did for me and let her grow in it. Because I didn't know anything about um, robotics or programming or development then, but he saw that I had an interest in tools and putting things together. So he put, you know, gave me a C++ book, gave me robots to build, and mm -hmm. I just kept going with it. So I want to do the same thing. Okay, you had your experience with the internet providers. I mean, that was what um, prompted you to see opportunities in Nigeria, right? When you first got in in 2012. 2012. Yes, and now I would say it's, it is better, but better. people are complaining, actually with the cost, and they tell you, oh, I think it's expensive, and even when you buy unlimited, it doesn't feel like unlimited. So what would you say we have not gotten right because it's a field you play in? What would you say the network providers are not getting right? So I would say that, um, and this is important to note, that for the speed and the lack of unlimited, everybody should try wireless NG. Okay. So we solve the problem, mm -hmm. right? Just joking. But I think, generally speaking, I think that from the time, since 2012 until now, I think we've had significant improvements across the IT, ICT sector, mm -hmm. whether it's browsing, internet, whether it's communications, video conferencing, whether it's tools. I think we've seen a lot of growth. Um, but I think that, of course, there's um, some infrastructure issues that you know providers have to work around. Um, there's some power issues that uh, providers have to work around. So I think that although everybody is trying their very best, um, it's still, we still have room for growth. That's mm -hmm. why companies like, you know, smaller companies like Wireless NG are trying to come up with disruptive technologies to be able to fill in that gap um, and take advantage of some of these deficiencies because if there were no deficiencies, we wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. So you're saying their deficiencies of course. are caused by the fact that we have infrastructure and power issues in Nigeria? I say that the deficiencies are caused by the fact that there's some areas that we can't solve problems 
um, without some things in place, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of expensive sometimes to run a tower 24-7. Um, on a generator and it's kind of expensive sometimes to invest in like solar panels and things of that nature mm -hmm. so I think that we need you know there's more um, we need lower cost um, ICT solutions mm -hmm. that to run on uh, less power like our towers to fill in those gaps I mean because infrastructure issues can be solved with entrepreneurial ideas mm -hmm. and that's anywhere you go doesn't okay, matter if so it's here are Nigerians or in expecting too much or demanding too much when it comes to data services? I think we, I think anybody in the world is demanding too much when it comes to data services because it doesn't matter if you're in Nigeria, it doesn't matter if you're in the U.S., it doesn't matter if you're in the U.K. Everybody wants bandwidth. Like mm -hmm. all we do 24/7 is browse. Mm -hmm. So no matter how much bandwidth you give somebody, they'll be able to consume it. So I think there's a healthy balance because you know bandwidth now can be for an individual person can be unlimited, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, there's, there, you know, you can use it for video conferencing, you can use it for Netflix, you can use it for YouTube, you can use it for browsing, you can use it for so many different things. So I don't think it's demanding too much. I think it's just that everything we're doing now is online, so. Okay, let's go on another break. But when we come back, we'll definitely have a dose on here, right here with us. Welcome back. This is Plus TV Africa. Um, earlier on, you mentioned the TV show you followed. Yes. And it inspired you. Now, let's talk about our content consumption and the social media age. How important would you rate the kind of content we consume? You know, I have mixed feelings about social media mm -hmm. and uh, online content. Okay. Because I think that once upon a time, I think mass media... Um, kind of curated what we received. And social media came in because people wanted to be able to get real-time information mm -hmm. from people, from actual people, um, from independent sources. But I think what also ended up happening is that a lot of times we have people um, curating their own lives and curating their own experiences and making everything perfect. So for the average person, when you're on social media, you're looking around, you're seeing what everybody else is doing and not really understanding the reality of it. So you're aspiring to achieve something that's not really sustainable. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that filtering and understanding sometimes, not, not everything you see online is real, okay. it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So I think what you consume is important because you're going to set subconsciously expectations based on what you see. Mm -hmm. And if you see this perfect life and this perfect world and this perfect everything and no one that's ever wrong, then you run into problems and whenever you run into an issue where, um, you know, there's some type of negativity that you face. So I think it's important for us to understand that sometimes things are curated, right? Mm -hmm. And people who are successful or people who are doing well or just average everyday people like me should be able to tell the world that, look, not everything's always perfect. You should be able to see real time, like the struggles, right? You see what you're actually, what it took to get to where you're going, not just mm -hmm. the end result, because if you just see the good, like you focus, the people will have unrealistic expectations as to how fast it will be or how quick it will take for you to get there. Mm -hmm. So I think um, what you consume is important because if you're always consuming things that are not really based on reality or curated, then how can you compete against that? All right, um, the youths, do you think they're doing enough? I, I think uh, being a millennial myself, uh, I think that uh, doing enough is relative, right? Um, I'm a millennial, um, and I'm not sure, I can't remember what the generation is after me, but I do understand that as a millennial and the generation after us, we require a different type of development <laughs> instruction, right? Most, what we're starting to see out of the social media age, I think is you're seeing more creatives. Um, I think that there was an article I read the other day about um, millennials and the younger group participate in the gig economy, the Ubers of the world and things of that nature because that's where they're going. So I think it's not necessarily um, they're not doing enough or they're not doing or they're doing too much. It's just the fact that I think that when you look at dealing with millennials and this next generation, mm -hmm. we have to look at how to interact with us and them because they require a different type of uh, guidance. Mm. It requires a different type of um Instruction, like you said, we are, mm -hmm. we are in the fourth industrial revolution, and some will tell you they are scared of our, the jobs humans would normally do being taken away by robots. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would pose real threats, especially when we know that we still battle unemployment? 
Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think that we should be uh, concerned with that because I think that there's still going to be jobs that robots or artificial intelligence can't do. I think what, uh, what you're going to get with artificial intelligence is the same thing we're getting now, mm -hmm. right? You have these massive algorithms that are mining all this data to be able to project to us what we want to buy mm -hmm. or what they think we want to buy, right? And I think there's a fine line between what we want to buy and what people are pushing us to buy, but that's another point. But I think that if you, if artificial intelligence is going to eliminate jobs and we subscribe to that belief, then if I'm a, if I'm creating a product or I'm offering a service, then who's going to consume it? Because ultimately the basis of business is to buy and sell, right? So if all the jobs are gone, where's the income that people are going to be buying going to come from? Mm -hmm. right? So I don't, I don't think that's the approach. I think it's meant to be able to create efficiencies, but it can't be to replace all the jobs and it won't replace all the jobs because if nobody's able to generate any income, mm -hmm. what happens to the rest of the world? Okay, well, there's a list of jobs that are going around and they'll tell you if you love your children, don't have them be part of these jobs because in the next five to 10 years, um, it should be irrelevant. What type of jobs? I mean, like accounting and they tell you there could be just an app that would get this job done without having someone or too many people, even if you have someone to um, put in the figures, mm -hmm. you don't need too many people getting the job done. So looking at that now, what would you advise people to impact in their children to be able to have a place in this new world? Let me put it that way. I think that I, I always welcome new worlds because mm -hmm. they offer new challenges. And I think that um, it's not that I don't know, but I don't think it's that, that the uh, jobs will be lost. I think it's just that we as individuals just have to become better, mm -hmm. right? An accountant now is just like, you know, it's a, I, I believe in competition. I welcome competition. I love competition because to me, competition makes us and me as an individual a better person. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're going to get with that is more competition. So I think that what we need to do is prepare our children to be more efficient, smarter, faster, quicker than everybody else, right? Okay. Because if you want to be an accountant, just because I would take that list and I would show it to my child and I'll say, hey, my baby, my beautiful baby girl, look, they're telling you that a few years from now that you can't be an accountant. If this is what you want to be, you're going to prove them wrong and she's going to work twice as hard to be able to be smarter than any algorithm or any machine because she is good at what she does. I think that the human element can never be taken. Mm -hmm. We've been able to come from where we were many, 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 many eons ago until in this advanced society now because we have this insatiable desire to continue to achieve. And achievement is what we are. So I don't think we're going to allow any machines to be able to eliminate all our jobs. We'll just become more efficient because ultimately somebody has to design the systems. right? Mm -hmm. and. Um, if there's a problem and, you know, if you submit your tax return and somebody queries it, the robot's not going to answer it. Mm -hmm. You need somebody to defend it for you. So mm -hmm. those jobs are always going to be there. To me, it's just we just got to get more efficient and smarter. Okay, so you were outside the country and you came back, then you saw opportunities. But we have people here who have decided to say, you know what, I need to leave or I don't think I'm going to make it in life. What would you say is the difference between you and that type of person? And would you encourage people just leaving the country? I think Nigeria is the most beautiful country in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that our cultures, our people, our desires, our dreams are phenomenal. And, you know, some people, you know, everybody's entitled to do what they want to do, right? Some people just may not like it. I mean, it doesn't matter what country you live in. Some people just want to leave, right? And mm -hmm. experience something different. Like, we have free spirits. But I think that there's so many opportunities here. I think that there's so much growth remaining here. I think that the future is here. Right? And I think that Nigeria is a place that nobody should leave, right? Because there's so much left to do. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good sometimes to step outside of a situation to get a different perspective. But when you come back to it, you come with that perspective and you're able to see things with a fresh set of eyes. So I think it's important. I mean, you know, I can't tell anybody to stay or leave, but mm -hmm. I would definitely say for individuals who are interested in expanding and growing, especially um, Nigerians in the diaspora, it's a beautiful place to be, come back to. I mean, mm. it's not a simple thing. You're not just going to come into any environment and take, uh, take advantage of opportunities and grow. But I mean, it's a challenge. And mm -hmm. me personally, I live for challenges. So if you're a risk taker and somebody that likes to be competitive, then why not be here? OK, so before I let you go, what advice would you give the younger ones? I mean, you're young and you're doing well. 
and we hope to have more young successful people that we can project to say these are Nigerians. Nigerians are not first class. Nigerians are not um, in the environment to cause any havoc, right? Yeah. So what advice would you give someone looking up to you to say, I want to be this or I want to be bigger? What would you say? I mean, you can do it. See, I, um, I am more inspired by my family and my team because I've, I've some people on my team have been through some interesting situations and they've come from some difficult situations and they found their way out of it and that drives me and it just it for anybody who is um, looking to to grow and to be better I think it's very important to remain positive and understand that it's possible mm -hmm. but again in this society and global culture, not isolated to anywhere individually, things don't happen fast. We're used to having very instant gratifications because, you know, it's the system, right? We need affirmations yesterday for something that we post today, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't get that, we don't have, we don't feel fulfilled and we feel depressed and we feel sad. But I think that success is never a definitive thing. It's a constant thing because success in one moment is not success in another moment. Right? You can be successful today, and tomorrow things can fall apart. You have to continuously be successful, so you have to prepare yourself for a journey. And while you're young, you have this opportunity to completely build yourself, to develop your internal workings, because physically, it's always good to be healthy. I mean, I got really, really fat. Like, I gained 50 pounds, so mm -hmm. I was totally unhealthy for a while, but I had to refix my, uh, myself. But what was important is what was inside of me never changed. So in the moments in which I found myself like in a complete disaster 24 seven, I was able to hold on to what I had built over the many years to be able to prepare me through it. So while you're starting your journey, especially when you're young, you shouldn't be looking to win right now. You should be looking to prepare yourself, to prepare your internal working, your mind, your soul, your spirit, your emotions, to be able to control yourself so when you reach that pinnacle that you're trying to achieve, you can continue to push yourself to exceed past that. And it's, like I said, success is not something that just happens. And some people get lucky. But the problem is, we can never focus on the anomalies. We always want to focus within one to two standard deviations from the mean. And most of us are not just going to get lucky. And luck to me is a very interesting term, but we have to earn it. And it takes time. It takes going to, I know some people say school means nothing, but to me it means everything. because. The time you spend in developing yourself in school, developing your mind, it's not just what you're learning from the books or you're learning from your teachers, it's the social interactions, it's the growth, it's the understanding how to survive, it's the struggle. Like, it's important to have a struggle because it prepares you for when you're going to struggle in the future. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you're super successful, you have everything you need and you put it in an environment where you're operating a business, mm -hmm. you're going to struggle. And if you've never experienced how to survive past that, it's gonna to be tough for you then. And it's better to fail a lot earlier than when you're there. So just time, take your time. Take your time. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. All right, I've been chatting with Ed Dose on here, who is a serial entrepreneur. You can catch this conversation and all our exclusive content online by subscribing to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Plus TV Africa. I'm Elsie Godwin saying thank you for watching and see you later.